Good afternoon, everyone. It is wonderful to see you all here. Uh, welcome, welcome. Good afternoon. My name is Christiana Ochoa, and I'm the Dean Designate of the Maurer School of Law. Uh, I wasn't really expecting that, but thank you very much. <laughs> Um, it is my absolute pleasure to welcome to the law school, Linda Greenhouse, who I will introduce very shortly. Before doing that, I'd like to thank the sponsors of this event. In order to leave as much time as possible, though, I'll just provide a brief synopsis of, the, of each of the sponsors so that we know who they are rather than having them each come up to the lectern. Um, the three sponsors are the Indiana University Pointer Center, the Federalist Society, and the American Constitutional Society. The Pointer Center for the Study of Ethics and in American Institutions was founded by the late Herman B. Wells in the wake of the Watergate scandal with generous funding from the then chair of the board of the Times Publishing Company, who had been, a, who had served on the Indiana Daily Student prior to that. His name was Nelson Pointer. Over the decades, the center has focused on some of the most pressing ethical questions of our time, many of which Linda Greenhouse has covered in her reporting of the Supreme Court. The Federalist Society describes itself as an organization of law students, lawyers, and academics, and other practitioners committed to the sound principles of conservative and libertarian legal philosophy. By providing a forum for legal experts of opposing viewpoints, the Federalist Society has redefined the terms of legal debate and fostered a greater appreciation for the role of separation of powers, federalism, limited constitutional government, and the rule of law in protecting individual freedom and traditional values. The third sponsor today, the American Constitution Society, describes itself as realizing the promises of the US Constitution by building and leading a diverse legal community that dedicates itself to advancing and defending democracy, as well as justice, equality, and liberty, to securing a government that serves the public interest and to guarding against the abuse of law and the, and the concentration of power through a diverse nationwide network of progressive lawyers, law students, judges, scholars, and many others, ACS works to uphold the Constitution in the 21st century by ensuring that the law is a force for protecting our democracy and the public interest and for improving people's lives. Thank you to all of the sponsors of this event, and thank you all for joining us today. Before I introduce Ms. Greenhouse, I would like to let you be sure that you all know that you are um, uh, invited tomorrow evening to the lar to a, a large uh, formal lecture that Carol Green Linda Greenhouse will be <laughs> will be um, delivering tomorrow, uh, titled "A Weaponized Court in a Fragile Democracy." That'll be tomorrow at 7 p.m. in Franklin Hall. So I am honored to introduce Linda Greenhouse. And I, for those of you who um, may know the reason I slipped and just said Carol Greenhouse is because we have the also great honor of having her sister housed in our offices upstairs. Mm -hmm. um, one could say so much about Linda Greenhouse. Indeed, whole books could be written about her, um, but I will be brief. Linda Greenhouse is the Knight Distinguished Journalist in Residence and Joseph Goldstein Lecturer in Law at Yale Law School. She is a graduate of, Red, of Redcliffe College and received a master's of studies in law uh, degree from Yale Law School. She was a reporter for the New York Times from 1968 to 2008, serving as the newspaper Supreme Court correspondent for nearly 30 years, starting in 1978. Among other major journalism awards, she received a Pulitzer Prize in journalism in the category of beat reporting in 1998. Currently, she writes a twice monthly op-ed column on the Supreme Court for the New York Times website, for which she is a contributing writer. She is the author of six books that include the U.S. Supreme Court, A Very Short Introduction, as well as Becoming Justice Blackman, a biography of Harry A. Blackman, and The Burger Court, and The Rise of the Judicial Right, which was co-authored with Michael Garretts. Most recently, in 2001, she published Justice on the Brink, The Death of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, The Rise of Amy Coney Barrett, and 12 Months That Transformed the Supreme Court. For her contributions in helping the world understand the court, from internal relationships and battles through decisions that have both polarized the nation and those that have merely fascinated it, she has been abundantly, though perhaps still insufficiently recognized. Linda Greenhouse is the president of the American Philosophical Society, the country's eldest learned society. She also serves on the Council of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. She's on the National Senate of Phi Beta Kappa 
and is one of two non-lawyer honorary members elected to the American Law Institute. She has been honored with 13 honorary degrees, including from Indiana University in December of 2016. But perhaps the greatest honor for a person like Linda Greenhouse is that she is a household name. Not an easy feat, even for a journalist for the New York Times. This honor is well earned by the consistently thorough, deep, insightful, incisive, and thoroughly accessible coverage of the legal controversies that she has provided to all of us in this room and many who have sat in this room well before us for more than five decades. Linda Greenhouse argu arguably knows more about the court and about its justices themselves over the last 50 years than any other person on the court or off. And she has increasingly, increasingly argued that the court is threatening its own popular legitimacy and, and its place in the constitutional order. Mm -hmm. Of course, as you know, her time as a journalist covering legal issues and the court is nearly coterminous with the court's now overruled 1973 Roe v. Wade decision. In the immediate aftermath of the Dobbs decision, she wrote of her own decades long relationship to the abortion controversy and jurisprudence, quote, 49 years is a long time but professional lives, including mine, are long as well. I was a freshly minted journalist at the Times in 1969 when I received an assignment to write about the growing controversy over abortion. It was, I believe, the first article in a general interest publication to survey the nascent constitutional arguments, and it has been quite widely reprinted. When I finished reading Friday's decision, speaking of the Dobbs opinion, in preparation for writing this essay, I realized that I will have chronicled this profound issue across its entire arc, a perspective I never could have anticipated. Of the Dobbs opinion, she wrote in that article last June that, quote, what the court delivered on Friday is a, requ is a requiem for the right to abortion. As Chief Justice Don John Roberts, who declined to join Justice Alito's opinion, may well suspect it is also a requiem for the Supreme Court. Her concern for the court is among the topics she will cover in what I know will be an excellent and engaging talk. Ms. Greenhouse, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for that very generous introduction. Um, and I should say that my that recent book uh, that the Dean mentioned has just come out in paperback with a new subtitle and the subtitle is A Requiem for the Supreme Court. Um, I'm happy to see the mayor of Bloomington, Mayor Hamilton here, thank you for coming. And it's great to be um, at a law school where the new dean is greeted with such warmth and uh, <laughs> speaks very, very well of you and of, of, and, and of IU. So I'll start my rather informal uh, set of observations and, and reminiscences and um, leave plenty of time for conversation with, with you all. Um, so I'll begin. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can be used against you in a court of law. It was April 19th, 2000. I was sitting in the Supreme Court in my accustomed seat in the front row of the press section. The man intoning those words was the Chief Justice of the United States, William Rehnquist, who had just announced to the courtroom audience that he had the majority opinion in Dickerson against the United States and was beginning his what's called a hand down, the oral summary of the opinion. I knew the case, of course. The question was whether Congress had the constitutional right by means of a statute enacted decades earlier in response to the Miranda decision to legislatively overrule Miranda against Arizona and return to the voluntariness standard for the admissibility of statements given during custodial interrogation, the standard that Miranda had rejected. The arrival of the Dickerson case at the Supreme Court was the product of a years long political project to get the Rehnquist court to overrule this landmark of the Warren court. William Rehnquist was famously a dyed in the wool critic of Miranda. So sitting there listening to him recite the Miranda warnings, I had some cause to wonder whether I, and by implication, the rest of the world were hearing them for the last time. But as you know, it didn't turn out that way. The Miranda warnings the Chief Justice wrote in his majority opinion had become part of, quote, our national culture. Miranda was, he said, a constitutional decision of this court 
and it could not be overruled by statute. The vote was seven to two. The dissenters were Justices Scalia and Thomas. What do you suppose the vote would be on today's Supreme Court? The Rehnquist Court decided Dickerson 22 years ago. Why would it have any more stare decisis weight than Planned Parenthood against Casey, which reaffirmed the right to abortion a mere 30 years ago? After Dobbs, what does stare decisis mean anyway? Well, this is not a talk about Miranda. And before moving on, I'll just acknowledge that Dickerson was something of a Pyrrhic victory for people who follow criminal procedure. The court wasn't really reaffirming Miranda so much as reaffirming what was left of Miranda after its scope had been whittled away by many intervening decisions about waiver and admissibility. But rather, this is a talk about what's happened to the Supreme Court during the 45 years that it's been my privilege to make a living by following the court in something close to minute detail. And I'm not the longest living person to be doing that. Uh, one of them is Nina Totenberg from NPR, who was at it when I got there and who just came out with a memoir that I'm reading right now. It's very interesting. And, uh, and Lyle Denniston, some of you may follow on SCOTUS blog and other places. So I, I don't quite claim that title yet. Um, <laughs> but in thinking about the trajectory from the 1978 term when I first showed up at One First Street Northeast as the New York Times Supreme Court correspondent, it occurred to me <clears throat> The Chief Justice Rehnquist's opinion, Dickerson, might be a useful framing advice, a framing device for this talk. Now, younger members of the audience, I think that's most of you, might have only a dim image of William Rehnquist, who died in office 17 years ago this past Labor Day weekend after serving on the court for 33 years. But in his time, he loomed very large. Named to the court by Richard Nixon, he was still an associate justice and only in his seventh term when I started covering the court. He was the rank outsider on the Burger Court then, well to the right of the court's center of gravity, often a lone dissenter, poking at the mid-century settlement on civil rights and criminal justice. The left hated him. When President Reagan named him in 1986 to succeed Warren Burger as chief justice, the resulting confirmation battle was brutal even though had he not been confirmed, he would still have been on the court. There was something highly performative about the fight that the Democrats, then a minority in the Senate, put up against him. They knew they couldn't defeat the nomination. They just wanted to be sure the country knew what a right-wing zealot looked like. But here's my point. If William Rehnquist were on the court today, he would be not on the far right, but comfortably in the middle, maybe even slightly to the left of the middle. Those who do remember Rehnquist may find that a shocking assertion, and I understand that reaction. I expect, for example, that he would have been in the majority in Dobbs, and happily so. He was one of the two original dissenters in Roe against Wade, and he tried in the post-Roe cases, including Planned Parenthood against Casey, to take the court as far as he could in the direction of overturning Roe. So yes, I'm not saying that Rehnquist in his old age morphed into a version of his Burger Court nemesis, William Brennan. But consider his majority opinion toward the end of his tenure in Locke against Davey, a 2004 case about the relationship between the First Amendment's two religion clauses, the Free Exercise Clause and the Establishment Clause. The question was the constitutionality of a state program that subsidized post-secondary tuition <clears throat> but excluded courses of study for a ministerial degree. Those, <clears throat> the use of state money for a ministerial degree was ruled out uh, by the state. A would-be ministerial student sued on the ground that the exclusion violated his right under the free exercise clause. The Rehnquist opinion held that it did not. The state could choose <clears throat> to include devotional study without violating the establishment clause, Rehnquist wrote, but it was not obliged to do so under the free exercise clause. There needed to be room for what he called play in the joints between the two religion courses, clauses. <clears throat> Compare this to the Roberts court decision this past term in Carson against Macon, a free exercise case from Maine. Maine pays high school tuition for students whose own school districts lack a high school of their own, but the state excluded religious schools from eligibility. That exclusion amounted to anti-religious discrimination that violated the free exercise clause, 
Rehnquist's former law clerk, Chief Justice Roberts, wrote for the court. So what about play in the joints? What happened to that? Roberts acknowledged in his opinion that there once had been a case called Locke against Davy, and the court did not formally overrule Locke, but the Chief Justice denied its applicability in this case, distinguishing it so completely that while it remains in U.S. reports, you can still read it, Locke against Davy will never be cited by the Supreme Court again. There is no more play in the joints. Religion always wins in today's Supreme Court. One more example. Rehnquist's majority opinion in a case from 2003 that signaled the end of the federalism revolution that was a mark of the early of his early chief justiceship. That case was Nevada Department of Nevada Department of Human Resources against Hibbs. The question was whether Congress had the constitutional authority to bind the states as employers to the requirements of the Family and Medical Leave Act. Earlier decisions in this series of federalism cases had held that Congress lacked the power to require state employers to abide by either the Americans with Disabilities Act or the Age Discrimination and Employment Act. But Hibbs was different, Rehnquist said. He interpreted the Family and Medical Leave Act as an effort by Congress to mitigate sex discrimination on the job by treating family care as an obligation of all employees and not just of women. The effort of this sex neutral law, he said, was to erase the stereotype that family care was women's work. Over the dissenting votes of Justices Scalia, Thomas, and Kennedy, Redquist concluded that Congress's authority under Section 5 of the 14th Amendment gave it the power to abrogate the state's 11th Amendment immunity. And I remember uh, Justice Ginsburg telling me uh, that when she brought the opinion home and showed it to her husband, he said, did you ghostwrite this? <laughs> what differentiated Hibbs from the earlier state immunity decisions was that framing the case as one about sex discrimination brought heightened scrutiny into play, giving the statute at issue a greater constitutional dimension. To accept state immunity in this context would inevitably lead to challenges under Title VII and other core civil rights statutes. In other words, it would be to risk driving the Supreme Court off a cliff and that's what Rehnquist refused to do. Who among today's conservative justices would show such restraint, especially if they had the votes? Core civil rights statutes have already fallen to religion in the Roberts Court so-called ministerial exception cases, barring discrimination claims by secular employees who happen to work for religiously affiliated employers. So yes, the court has changed in the last 45 years, and you didn't need to bring me to Bloomington to tell you that. That this is the most conservative court since the 1930s is no longer even a very interesting observation. But as is often true about the court, the more granular you get, the more interesting it looks. So what's interesting is not simply conservatism writ large. It's conserv conservatism deployed to what end? by what means, by what degree of consistency. For anybody interested in the court, it's the close look, not the broad brush that pays dividends. So I don't intend this to be a talk about doctrine. I'll just say that when I started covering the court and for some years afterward, the word originalism was not to be heard. As you know, but the general public doesn't know, there's nothing original about originalism. As we've come to know it, it was largely an invention of the Reagan revolution's conservative intellectual infrastructure with two apologies to all the Fed Sox students here. We can discuss this later. I think I first heard it in connection with Robert Bork's nomination to the Supreme Court in 1987. And Bork, by the way, was my antitrust professor at Yale. I knew him, I liked him. We socialized a bit when he first came to Washington to take up his position as a waiting position in waiting as a judge on the DC circuit, but that's a whole other story. I certainly had not heard there was anything problematic about citing legislative history until Antonin Scalia arrived at the court. So I've lived through revolutions in both constitutional and statutory interpretation. I've lived to see the unheralded birth of the Chevron Doctrine it's surprising apotheosis as one of the most frequently cited Supreme Court decisions of all time and as functional overruling in its role 
in a, <clears throat> once once its role in empowering the administrative state came to be seen as a bug rather than a feature. I've seen things that no one would have predicted when I received my master's degree from Yale Law School in 1978. Certainly there would be a woman on the Supreme Court one day, but the year before Sandra Day O'Connor was nominated, a Broadway play called First Monday in October about a fictional first woman on the Supreme Court played the very idea for laughs. It was a comedy. No one would have predicted a Supreme Court with three Jews, six Catholics, and not a single Protestant. And that's what it was before Katanji Jackson was confirmed uh, last spring. The court I first knew was a very closed and secretive place. Of course, people today say the same thing about the court, but there's no overestimating the impact that the internet has had on public accessibility to the court and its work. The court's website, as you know, supremecourt.gov, is a window onto aspects of the court's operations that were just unattainable in the pre-internet days. For example, the court's electronic docket function shows at a glance the procedural history of every petition, every application the court receives, every pleading that's filed, every time the case is listed for conference or taken off the conference list, which itself is interesting data point. Of course, I'd like to know why a cert petition is taken off the conference list, of why it's relisted multiple times before being acted on, as the Dobbs petition was throughout the winter and spring of 2020, 2021. But with experience and close reading and access to the internet, it's possible to make some pretty accurate assumptions in most cases. Transcripts of the court's oral arguments would not be available when I started for about two weeks after the argument, and then only in a single paper copy that had to be passed around the entire press corps. A news organization could contract with the court's outside transcription service to get a same-day transcript at considerable expense per page and it would be delivered by messenger late in the afternoon. Now the transcripts appear on the website within hours, and the audio of the arguments used to be available only at the end of the term through the National Archives. Even before the pandemic brought us real-time live streaming of the arguments, and I assume you're all listening to those, the court had begun the practice of posting the audio of all the week's arguments every Friday. And of course, the opinions appear on the website as soon as they're handed down. When I started on the beat, the only way to get your hands on a newly issued Supreme Court opinion was to physically be at the court and literally get the slip opinion handed to you, a little booklet uh, placed in your hands. And I had to get two copies of every decision. People have trouble believing this, but I, I think my memory is not failing me. I had to get two copies of every decision so that one packet of them could be put on a bus that would go up to the Port Authority bus terminal in New York, where it would be retrieved by a messenger from the New York Times headquarters building down the street uh, for the use of the editorial board so that they could opine the next day on the opinion. It's crazy, but true. Uh, today, I mean, truly, that was another world. It was a, a world in slow motion by today's standards, where simple facts were, were hidden behind many screens. So for many of our students today here and back where I teach, their first consciousness of the Supreme Court came with the notion of a swing justice. The one that they knew was Anthony Kennedy. The standard ideological array, it seemed, was always going to be four justices on, on one side, four justices on the other, and the one in the middle who would make all the difference. The one that anyone with a Supreme Court case had to pitch the argument to. It's Justice Kennedy's world, and we're just living in it, as the saying went. But when I started covering the court, there was no swing justice. There was instead a broad middle group. You may not even recognize these names. Potter Stewart, Byron White, Lewis Powell, plus Harry Blackman and John Paul Stevens before they moved to the left. These justices didn't form a coalition. When they voted together in twos or threes or fours, that just reflected the nature of the case. Justice White, for example, was conservative on criminal law. He was one of the original Miranda dissenters, but very liberal on civil rights and on questions of federal versus state authority. White was named to the court by John F. Kennedy. He was also one of the two dissenters in Roe. While Justice Powell, named by Richard Nixon, joined Harry Blackman, another Nixon appointee in Roe, and remained a strong supporter of the right to abortion until his retirement. So these people were not 
you couldn't sl you know, slate them into, into little boxes. It was Powell, just by the way, who Robert Bork was supposed to replace, which is what made the Bork nomination such a lightning rod. No one arguing before the court back then could afford to take any of this broad middle of the court for granted. It was the cases rather than the identities that appeared to drive the decisional process. And it was also true in those years that no one could look at the court and see a reflection of presidential politics. The most liberal justice, Brennan, was an Eisenhower appointee. And Eisenhower was Republican for those who don't know that. And Stevens was Gerald Ford's sole appointee another Republican. It was not until Stevens' retirement <clears throat> in 2010, by which time he had become the, <clears throat> a, more, a more conservative court's most liberal member, that the justices' ideology reflected the party of the president who appointed each of them. Every conservative justice on the court then had been appointed by a Republican, every liberal justice by a Democrat. That was something new. I'm not, I don't hold myself out as a huge um, expert in American history, but I think that was the first time in history that that was true. And it signaled danger. It might have suggested, it might have suggested to the incumbent justices that it was time for a certain modesty, a certain caution, born of the awareness that it would not serve the court well if the public could not be blamed for seeing the court and its work as little more than a reflection of politics. Well, that was then. And now, of course, we once again don't have a swing justice. We keep expecting one to show up. Could it be Chief Justice Roberts? Could it be Brett Kavanaugh? Well, not yet. The six justice conservative supermajority, I think, will inevitably fracture over how far and how fast to go in pursuit of what will be their common agenda. And that was Dobbs, after all. And it didn't matter that the Chief Justice didn't join Alito. It didn't matter for the bottom line. So 45 years is a long time to have been setting my internal clock by the Supreme Court's calendar. And I chose this week to come to IU because the court's not sitting this week. So <laughs> didn't have to worry about the court this week. Stephen Breyer was the last sitting justice born before me. And once Justice Stevens retired, there was no one left on the court who was there when I began. So I'm not sure where that leaves me, other than having earned the right to be a little judgmental. <laughs> a little sad and quite a bit fearful for the welfare of an institution that I've devoted my professional life to trying to understand. Thank you. There's a microphone here, and because this is being recorded, um, you're asked to, and for my not so great hearing also, uh, you're asked to ask questions at the mic so that it can be, so that it can be picked up. So. I see, so, do I see somebody crawling over to come down? <laughs> or are you just leaving? <laughs> Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for coming. I have two unrelated questions. So the first one is about the leak of the Dobbs opinion. As a journalist, as a lawyer, somebody who covers the court, I imagine you might have some uh, nuanced views on the legitimacy of that. So I'm curious about your thoughts on the leak. My other question is about Totenberg's book. Uh, Stephen Lubet, or Lubet, I don't know how to pronounce it, uh, had an op-ed a couple of weeks ago called The Conflict of Interest, based on the relationship that Totenberg had as a journalist with her friend. And he wrote, it was the sort of relationship that objective journalists do not maintain with the subjects of their reporting, but Totenberg shrugs it off. So I'm curious if you have any thoughts on, on that criticism. Thank you. Okay, so uh, my thought about the leak, I have no more than just a citizen's, uh, you know, bewilderment about it, uh, you know, and who would do such a thing. And I think it's bad. And um, uh, I have no insight into it. Uh, you know, what makes it what makes it interesting, um, considering 
what happened two months later, which was that they came down with Dobbs and it, it was the same as, as the leaked document, except for um, Alito's uh, several responses to the dissent. So I'm going to digress a, a minute because this is interesting, I think. <clears throat> Wait a minute. So in the penultimate paragraph of Alito's majority opinion in Dobbs, he says, um, we have no way of knowing how American politics and society are going to respond um, to what we're doing today. Well, that, I mean, that is so disingenuous because for two months, the country had been in an uproar over the leak, so much so that the court put up an eight foot fence around its perimeter because it was afraid of being overrun by anguished people. So for a little, so, so I went back after the pin came down, I went back to my copy of the leak draft to see whether he had that paragraph in there and he did. So in other words, he didn't have the humility or, or the, I don't know what, I guess, <laughs> don't press me for the, uh, nouns and adjectives, but, you, you know, to think, of course, he and the court knew exactly what the response was, but his next sentence was, and even if we knew, we would have no authority to tailor our opinion accordingly, which is BS, but we could go into that. Um, so your question about Nina, so, so whoever, I didn't catch who wrote that, uh, but that's sort of out there, you know, oh, horrible conflict. Whoever wrote that didn't read the book, because she makes it perfectly clear that their friendship went back um, to uh, 20 years before uh, Ruth Ginsburg went on the court. They were soul sisters from, they met in 1971. And uh, she makes it clear that they never talked about cases. And the one time she tried to ask uh, RPG a leading question, uh, uh, Ginsburg's response was, uh, why are you asking me that? And and Nina said, I can't help it. I'm a journalist. And that was the end of that. So, um, you know, I think it's it's fun to take pot shots at people and to uh, invoke, um, you know, the specter, the ever present specter of sanctimony in about journalism. But um, it's it, it's misplaced in this case. And I invite people to read the book. It's 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 really interesting for her. Um, uh as a feminist tract, really, and, and her early struggles in trying to make her way uh, in journalism and then in, in, in broadcast journalism. So, but thank you for asking. Thank you so much. Um, so in light of your observations about the ways in which the court has become more- A little bit louder. Or oh yes, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> in light of your observations about the ways in which the court has become so much more transparently political um, and, uh, and undermined confidence in the institution because of that, um, I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts about the various proposals that have been offered about changing the way Supreme Court justices are chosen um, or the composition of the court and whether you think any of those proposals would be useful in dealing with this problem. Not, I understand that any of them are likely to happen, but just uh, as, a, as a theoretical matter. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of any of the kind of court quote reform proposals. I don't think they would solve the current problem. I think what what would sell, what would help is to go back to the filibuster uh, for Supreme Court uh, confirmations. You know, we had a filibuster for a long time and um, the high courts of other countries that have very good Supreme Courts like Germany, that's that's written into their, I guess, their constitution that, that uh, a, a judge of their high court has to be confirmed by a supermajority. And, you know, that tends to assure a certain moderation in, in the nominations instead of, uh, you know, how far can I go either to the left or the right uh, to get 50 votes plus my vice president. And, you know, none of the Trump three would have been confirmed had there still been a filibuster. And, um, you know, I think that would be a very salutary thing to go back to. But obviously, Mitch McConnell got rid of, rid of the filibuster for 
a reason. And I can't expect that either side is going to engage in unilateral disarmament and say, oh, yeah, let's bring back a filibuster. But um, that would, I mean, that just can be done by Senate rule. You don't need a law. You don't need a constitutional amendment. That would be the easiest and I think the most useful fix. But I don't think it's going to happen. So uh, any students have questions? Don't be. Don't be shy. Hi, I was just wondering in the time you, well, you know, hold the mic. Sorry. I was just wondering in the time I have to been down so far. Uh, I was just wondering in the time you've been in the court observing, have you noticed a difference in newcomers to the court, freshman justices being, I don't know the right term, more I don't want to say arrogance, but less ready to be more modest and acknowledging that they're new. Maybe they shouldn't stake out the hard line positions right on day one. Uh, did they used to like defer more towards their seniors before? Have you noticed any change in that? So you're referring to Justice Jackson in the Alabama argument? I kind of like that, but just in general. <laughs> um. So I'm not real sure that your um, uh, description of the way things used to be is, is accurate. So, so when I started covering the court, arguments were quite passive. There was much less uh, questioning, much less cross-cutting, much less interrupting. Um, and then Justice Scalia came on the court in 1986. And, you know, he had been an active member of the D.C. Circuit. He was well experienced. And um, <laughs> he started sh shaking things up. And, <laughs> and so others, you know, followed. So I'm not sure there's a freshman, you know, kind of tradition of, of, of diffidence. Um, I mean, certainly Justice Jackson's performance in the Alabama case was super interesting. I mean... I didn't expect it. I mean, I st I share some of that sense. And when people had asked me in advance, you know, what impact do you think she'll have? And, you know, I was kind of ambivalent. I said, well, you know, she doesn't have the ability to, you know, move the court. So she'll probably just hang back for a while and let, you know, Justice Sotomayor and Justice Kagan kind of carry the carry the dissenting view. And then like, wow. And and so um I think what she did, I mean, obviously, was very intentional. I think was scoped out among the three, the, the three dissenters, um, <laughs> and I think very important. I mean, do I think it's going to change the outcome? No, I don't think so. But what struck me about it is that, um, for you know, no, nobody on today's court served with Justice Thurgood Marshall. Um, Clarence Thomas, of course, replaced Thurgood Marshall. But there was nobody there that had to deal with the presence on the court of a Black person who had, you know, walked that walk. And, and so for the first time, there's, you know, this young woman, Katanji Jackson, um, uh, facing off against the Alabama Solicitor General and matching him originalism for originalism. And hers was the more authentic. And, and so the fact that the majority on the court is going to have to respond to that voice, which they haven't heard before in their hallowed halls, is, um, is really fascinating. and and. So we're all in the same boat. We don't know where this is going to lead, but but we know it's really worth paying attention to. I'm wondering how you think your coverage and especially kind of the tone um, of writing when it comes to what kind of respect the court deserves um, and what kind of deference the court deserves would have differed if you had been beginning your career today with this court rather than the court that you began with? 
Oh, that's an interesting question. Could people hear? Yeah. Um, so, you know, I have to differentiate between um, my 30 years of actually covering the court as a daily reporter where, uh, you know, I wasn't supposed to be opinionating. Um, and then the 12 years or so that I've had various opinion platforms. Um, so I think there's a real challenge to the to the daily reporters today, um, because I think the, uh, you know, the sort of journalistic ethos that tells you, you know, there's two sides to every case and you give everybody their say and all this, um, you know, was greatly challenged by, in our politics, by the Trump years. And I actually wrote a book about this. It's a little book called Just a Journalist. and I think is challenged in today's court. I mean, you really can't just say, oh, the court today overturned Roe. I mean, you know, you've got to get, so what's the mission of, why cover the court? You know, why be a journalist at the court when anybody, you know, as I said, can go on the website, they can read Dobbs, you know, they can read all the briefs, everything's up there. They can read the argument, they can listen to the argument. So what value do you bring as a daily quote objective reporter is to give context and to say to people, you know, there used to be such a principle as adherence to precedent. And even though the court, um, you know, from time to time has not followed that, uh, the court has never before uh, overturned precedent in order to take away rights. The overturning of precedent has always been to grant more rights. And whenever they overturn precedent, they give reasons. And Dob Alito doesn't bother to give a reason in Dobbs. And, all, you know, I think a story that didn't inform the reader of all those things would, would be a journalistic failure. So I'd like to think that I would have done that and that if I had an editor who pushed back, um, I would have had an argument and I would have prevailed. And I have to say... And I, I had many arguments over time. I mean, I'll just tell you one. I mean, because it was not an easy job, I have to say. So uh, if you all know a case called um, Croson against City of Richmond, does that ring a bell? It was a 14th Amendment case um, that overturned a minority set-aside program in the in a, uh, City of Richmond, Virginia, set aside a certain percentage of uh, public contracting contracting work for uh, minority-owned businesses. And the court said that was unconstitutional because the Equal Protection Clause, you know, is colorblind. It works both ways. And you have to evaluate strict scrutiny by, by the standard of strict scrutiny, no matter uh, who, who is privileged. It was a major uh, turning point uh, for the court. So I, and it was leading the paper. So I wrote a lead that said, um, uh, in an opinion that uh, opinion that cast doubt on on all government affirmative action programs, comma the court today, blah blah blah. So you know, I went home and I phone rang, and it was the national editor who said, um, "We have to change your lead." I said, "Why?" Uh, she said, "Well, uh, Max Max Frankel, the executive editor, top boss." Um, doesn't think that uh, this decision casts doubt on all government affirmative action programs. I said, really? He doesn't think so. Uh, I said, I quit. She said, what? I said, well, he's the executive editor. He's entitled to have the Supreme Court correspondent whose judgment he trusts, and he obviously doesn't trust mine. So I quit. Wait, 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 she said. <laughs> And uh, we discussed it further, and um, I said, you know, I'm right. And uh, and we we kind of, we sort of reworded the thing where it still said the same thing, but it could be read by the executive editor as having been, like, changed somewhat. <laughs> anyway, I mean, I had to do that a couple of times. And, um, uh, you know, whatever. I mean, what can I say? But... Um, I think there are not, I mean, I don't mean to sound like self-aggrandizing. I don't think there are a lot of people that would have done that. They just would have crumped because like, it's nice to have a job the next day. But 
I didn't want to shove if it meant compromising, you know, my intellectual integrity. So, um, so I think I might have had a hard time if I started covering the court today. So. I forgot this is going out on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> um, last term, the court decided a case about a high school coach praying in oh, the yeah. public. And there's a line in the opinion that says this, Joseph Kennedy lost his job as a high school football coach because he knelt at midfield after games to offer a quiet prayer of thanks. Andy Koppelman, professor at Northwestern, writes, everything in that last sentence was false, and the court knew or should have known it was false. He didn't lose his job. He was offered an accommodation. Uh, he didn't pray quietly by himself. He was surrounded by a crowd that he had brought there and so forth. I guess, so this has been taken as an example of sort of, you know, just disregard for the truth and the service of Justice Gorsuch and others of an ideological agenda or a doctrinal agenda. But since you have a perspective of having known the court so well and read so many of its opinions, is there any precedent for this kind of just bald-faced, blatant falsehood, just, just misrepresentation of key facts in a Supreme Court opinion, and we just haven't noticed it before, or is this something new? I never saw anything like it. Um, just to bring people up to speed. So um, <clears throat> the, in the record of this case, and we assume Supreme Court justices read the lower court opinion, uh, what this coach did was uh, basically summon a mob to join him on the 50 yard line. People would run down from the stands. They knocked over, you know, players in the, in the high school band. Uh, state legislators came down. It was a huge circus. And the school district said, you know, you can't do this. We'll give you a place to pray and you have a right to pray, but you don't have a right to conduct a circus on the 50 yard line. So for the last three games, as he was trying to be, I think before um, a major right wing Christian right litigating group got hold of the case, he didn't summon the mob. He quietly prayed on a 50-yard line. So this whole thing is part of the record. And then he brought a lawsuit. Um, so for, you know, what Professor Sanders just read, um, it's just totally false. And But it's, it's out there. And the dissenters call, called the Cold Gorsuch on it, but you know, people don't read the dissent. And, and um NPR over the summer asked me to go on one of their shows, radio shows, uh, to talk about the court's uh, religion cases. And and the other person on the on the call uh was Michael McConnell from Stanford, who's a major scholar of of religion, very influential from the conservative side. And he described the case as Gorsuch did. And the host of the program didn't know enough to stop him. And I kept trying to intervene. And I said, Michael, that's not what happened. Didn't you read the lower court opinion? That's not what the case was. And he just kind of kept talking over me. And I, I ended up very frustrated. Uh, and, you know, what can you say to people? Read, you know, go find the district court opinion and read it. I mean, yeah, it's posted on the court's website. I mean, when you go, when you pull down the the docket search uh, menu, and the you you see the petition and the appendix. And the appendix has all the lower court um, uh, case, decisions, and so it's not super hard to find. But people are going to do that. So people now think that you know this poor little coach. All he wanted to do was you know thank God for the game quietly by himself, and that's not what it was. So. Yeah. Hi, Ms. Greenhouse. Thank you for being here. I'm a big fan. Read a number of your books. My question is, um, given where we are now, how do you find hope for the future of the Supreme Court? 
Um, I, I don't have a lot of hope for the Holy dog. Um, you know, I think we're stuck. I mean, I don't see any way out of the the box that we're in. And, you know, people always ask me that. And, you know, what I say is um, people who are upset about the court have to change their focus and change their focus to electoral politics. Because if anything's going to, you know, save us, uh, it's electoral politics and, and work, you know, uh, at, from the school board level to the town council, to the state legislature, to Congress, for people who share your view of this, because there's no way of directly influencing the justices, and they are who they are, and they're going to do what they're going to do. So. Sorry, I'm recovering from a broken ankle, so I'm a little slow. But um, so one of the things that we talk about is that the court to be successful requires a certain level of public buy-in. And maybe this is more of a past looking question given your previous answer. But um, I guess how much merit do you see in that? And what do you see as the role of reporters and journalism to facilitate that? Yeah, I think the court the court does require uh, at least a modicum of public buy-in. Um, and we haven't, in the lifetime of anybody still around, haven't seen anything quite like this. I mean, I could go into all the polling data, but, um, uh, you know, confidence in the court is just, has just plummeted uh, to the extent that um, political scientists who have devoted their careers to studying the relationship between the court and the public um, are now confessing in writing that they've been wrong. Uh, you know, there's this whole thing called um, positivity theory that says that when the Supreme Court issues a decision, most people, even if they don't agree with the decision, you know, kind of, it comes clothed in, in, in the symbols of authority. And so they accord it authoritativeness and kind of, you know, go along with it. Um, and that happened even in, in Bush against Gore, the case, the case that ended the 2000 election that everybody said, oh, the court is finished. No, it hardly made a blip in, in public attitudes toward the court. Um, so this is really something different. Um, and so you ask me, what's the role of journalism in a time like this? It's it's not to be a cheerleader for the court. I think it's to um, unpack and explain how did we get here? What's this about? How did this happen? You know, um, I mean, I'm going to be trying to address this somewhat in the uh, more formal talk that I'm giving uh, uh, tomorrow. But it's it's you know it's a deep question, and and I think. The highest role of journalism is to um, inform, by which, as I said earlier, by inform, I mean contextualize and, and just let people understand, uh, even in journalism about, you know, just a particular kind of much more ordinary Supreme Court decision, you know, it didn't drop from the sky on a balloon. You know, it came up as a cert petition and the court turns down 97% of all sort of petitions, but yet it granted this. And why did it grant this? And, and, you know, what does it hope to achieve? And what's the likely out, you know, impact of it? All that kind of stuff is, is part of uh, journalism's responsibility. Okay, so I read a book by Corey Robin, I believe his name is, um, called The Enigma of Clarence Thomas, which I found interesting. Um, part of it was compelling. Other parts didn't appear to make much sense to me. Um, the thesis of the book is basically that uh, Clarence Thomas has uh, basically a Black nationalist background, Black separatist background, which has morphed into this um, deep distaste of the state and liberals, um, and this idea that capitalism is, um, basically the only way out or the way, um, for Black Americans to, 
um, kind of come into their own. Um, and Robin sort of talks about how um, this idea, even if it's thinly veiled, permeates most of Thomas's opinion. Um, and I was just wondering your general thoughts on that. He talks about like um, Thomas's this very obvious dislike of affirmative action, um, his uh, frequent argument that you know money is speech, um, and he tries to like as he analyzes these arguments say that at the base of it is this race component, um, which obviously if anyone knows anything about Thomas sometimes doesn't seem to make sense because he has this you know wife who is basically a Fox News cheerleader and has. <laughs> all of these um, just really interesting contradictions with that. So it seems paradoxical to me. I was wondering what your thoughts were. Yeah, I've, I've, I've read the Corey Robin book is very interesting. Um, and I found it persuasive. And, uh, you know, I think Justice Thomas in his, in his separate writings, uh, you know, not his majority opinions, but his concurrences or his dissents, you know, tells us where he's coming from. Um, and, you know, you don't need to sort of put him on the couch to to sort of uh, get that. And, and I mean, for instance, his dissenting opinion in, in the Gruder case, in the Michigan Affirmative Action case, which is about to be overturned, but, uh, you know, where he talks you know, from his lived experience of having been a recipient of affirmative action and and how he thinks this has, um, you know, marked him and discredited him and, and, and so on. And uh, it's obviously totally sincere. Um, <clears throat> and it's totally authentic. <clears throat> but, you know, you have to hold it. Up, you have to compare him to uh, to Sonia Sotomayor, who also was the recipient of affirmative action when she got into Princeton, where she thrived and won like the highest student award. And so, you know, she would say, "Yeah, I benefited from affirmative action, and look what I made of those opportunities. Look what I did with it." And Thomas says, "You know, it's been a badge of dishonor." Well, like he's on the Supreme Court. I mean. <laughs> You know, I mean, I just wish he could get over that, but I, he, but that's that's his true belief, I'm sure. So, you know, it's just, um, I mean, I think the the book invites us to <coughs> have maybe more empathy than many of us, you know, have. Um, he's speaking his truth, and uh, you know, the issue is it has a big effect on American law. So, an interesting question. We're probably at time. Um, we are just so honored for you having joined us and thank you so much for your insights and your and your time.